tip. Uh, start small uh, before you get big. And then always, when you think you have enough wood, gather 10 times as much. Um, but really, when we look at fire, it's talking about a relationship, but it's also talking about goals. And so often people think that you can just light a fire, walk away, uh, it's gonna do its own thing. Or we might be able to get the big wood uh, to burn first. Uh, often like our goals, we dream big, thinking, uh, or often overlooking the small steps. So we've got a good bed of kindling. We're gonna add some uh, slightly uh, larger stuff now. And so the beauty of fire is really, uh, once you hear the snap, crackle, and pop, uh, you know that you have light. We met Alan through one of my good friends. She invited us to a new moon fire ceremony that Alan was hosting. It was minus 10 degrees Celsius in January, and a fire sounded really good. Alan was knowledgeable in native culture, so when time came to finding out about residential schools, we decided to ask Alan. You hear that pop, uh, so you know that there's somewhat, you hear that crackle. Uh, now we just need to hear a snap. Uh, once we hear a good snap, uh, we know that the moisture inside that fire uh, is where we need it. So you hear that crackle, pop. From what I'm aware, uh, you know, in an essence, the residential schools uh, were designed uh, to strip uh, the indigenous or the native child of his culture, his language, uh, his rites of passage, uh, all the uh, things that uh, grounded him within uh, the land, his history, uh, and ways of life. Uh, so everything I learned uh, about the land, uh, you know, I mean, in an essence, is quite quite a, a complex story, but uh, in a nutshell, growing up in foster care and children's aid uh, in a replication of residential schools, uh, I was taken from my family, placed into a, a foster care family uh, of, of, of Scottish uh, descent uh, and Christian religion. Uh, and as growing up, you know, my first introduction uh, really uh, in that sense uh, was going to Boy Scouts. Uh, and so Boy Scouts uh, is a very interesting organization because a lot of people couldn't be aware but also might not put into perspective uh, that Lord Baden Powell uh, on his uh, adventures for the, the Canadian military as he was set from east coast to west coast what he actually did is he recorded uh, all the rites of passages uh, and different uh, different uh, different teachings between uh, all the indigenous peoples uh, wherever he went. And so that when Boy Scouts was, was created, it was an actual replication of many indigenous cultures uh, and their connection to, to land, but also the responsibility of learning uh, how to take care of oneself, how to be ready, uh, how to take care of that fire. And so uh, as a young person growing up in that Canadian system, uh, I, uh, I had the opportunity to attend Boy Scouts and that was my first kind of leeway into, into nature and being into the outdoors. Uh, but when I really started to, um, I would say, get a deeper sense and, and understanding of, 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 of what nature really is, uh, is when I was 13. Uh, and so again, thinking about residential schools and the 60 scoop and how that played out. Uh, Toronto in the 80s, uh, there was a, a group of elders that came to the city uh, and they, uh, they had a vision to, 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 to create an opportunity uh, where, where, where different indigenous peoples um, from different aspects, whether it was from the prairies, the west coast or up north or down south, um, they wanted to create an organization that would connect, in a sense, lost Indigenous people, but people have been disconnected uh, and, and broken from the culture and ha had suffered uh, the effects of genocide in residential schools uh, to reconnect with the outdoors uh, in, in a cultural sense. And so when I was 13, I got to attend Native Child and Family Services uh, Grundy Lake Camp, which basically for five days was a full uh, immersion into, into the culture where uh, we had an elder, uh, we got to attend sweat lodge ceremony. Uh, we got to travel uh, in our traditional vessels by canoe. We slept in teepees. Uh, and so that was the first time 
uh, I think I was given a chance to really uh, reconnect culturally with the land uh, in a sense of, uh, of a whole new meaning. You know, as a kid growing up in, in Toronto, uh, you know, going through society, um, the land was really the only thing that um, made sense. Uh, you know, growing up within religion uh, and seeing the system and the way that the world was working, uh, all those things um, seemed faulty uh, in a sense that they weren't true in their real essence. And so for me, connecting with the land was seeing that um, all, around of us, all around us is life. Uh, these trees, uh, all this, um, everything that's gone into this fire uh, has lived its life to give up life uh, so that we can have life. Um, but to say to any residential school survivor, um, just let go of the trauma, let go of uh, the memories of the rape and the abuse and the neglect and, and all the hardship, um, I think that that scars alone uh, will always be present. But I can say if you have been fortunate enough to, to, to have children or grandchildren, um, it is never too late to bring them to this fire, to light this fire uh, and to share the stories of whatever it is that um, can be within your mind of memory. Uh, and so being kind, having compassion, finding forgiveness, maybe not so much for them, but finding that forgiveness for yourself to, um, to live again. Well, I think a lot of Canadians don't take into perspective a lot of their culture that they would call Canadian actually stems from Indigenous peoples. So one, we just came out of a crazy, horrible winter. Uh, and so there wasn't uh, once a month snow, but if anybody did uh, get an opportunity uh, to go out tobogganing, um, I definitely, uh, you know, emphasize that as an indigenous culture, as a practice. Uh, and for very, for a long time, you know, the Canadian government was against tobogganing. Even today uh, in the major cities, you know, most hills are closed down because they don't want you uh, out there sledding. Um, but for something really unique within the culture, um, I would say, the biggest thing for any Canadian to take away would be all my relations. Um, and so as a Canadian, uh, all my relations represents all of creation. From every bit of soil that, uh, that comes from the earth, every breath that we breathe, to, to, to every plant that grows in every shape and form that it does, uh, to every animal, whether it's the swimmers in the water, uh, the four-leggeds walking upon the earth, or the winged that are flying in the sky, um, to every race, every culture of humanity, that we as a being, as a life force, as all of creation, we are all relations, we are all connected, we are all intertwined. And until we can really comprehend that idea, if you think that a government a corporation designed to manipulate and to exploit all its relations is your only salvation, then uh, you've already, you've already, you're already lost. Um, and so I think one of the greatest takeaways from the culture is just knowing that all your relations, no matter how big, how powerful, how small, how weak, uh, we all depend on each other uh, to, to make uh, this life what we want to. So Boy Scouts Canada, you know, from when I was growing up and what I learned about it, is that uh, before the uh, effects of residential school were in full swing, um, there had already been a recordance happening of Indigenous rites of passage. Uh, so such as uh, young children 0 to 10, uh, 10 to, to, to 15, and 15 from 20, uh, there was a set of uh, a ways uh, of how to already understand how to take care of oneself, uh, such as the Boy Scouts uh, motto, uh, always be prepared. 
Uh, and so really, um, Boy Scouts uh, then continued to appropriate Indigenous cultures and ways of living and connecting with the land uh, for its own benefit, uh, in the essence to uh, create scouts uh, for its military that would uh, be able to go about the land. Well, no, I mean, in 1902, when, uh, when, when the first uh, Woodcraft Indians Club ad existed, all members were non-Indigenous. There wasn't a single Native boy or girl who were part of the Woodland Indians Craft Club. So it's irony at its best. Today, the Woodcraft Rangers, so they changed it to the Woodcraft Rangers Association instead of the Woodcraft Indians. There's over 15,000 youth. And I still bet you out of 15,000 youth, I bet you not more than 100 of them are Indigenous. Ugh. Well, that's it. There's a difference between appropriation and appreciation. And I think where Canadians have to understand is that um, there's a difference when you stand alongside somebody and you're supporting them versus, um, you know, standing beside them uh, trying to uh, do what it is that they're doing. Um, and so, for instance, I had, a, I, I had a, a, a Canadian friend of mine, and she's like, oh, I've got all this land, and I want to set up a retreat, and I think I should get some teepees, and, you know, I think I should get all these uh, Indigenous kind of, uh, you know, appropriation-style activities and stuff. And I was like, well, I understand that you want to appreciate the culture in a sense that you want to see it exist, but... There's an appropriation as a non-Indigenous person to do all of that yourself versus partnering with local Indigenous communities in partnership to support and supply the land with the finances to help them uh, do those things. I think when it comes to celebrating, I think everybody should come out for a strawberry uh, moon. I think everybody should come out and enjoy the sweet water. I think it's very important uh, for people to come out and to connect with the land and the culture. Uh, I just think when it's done in a partnership, it's done in a good way. Uh, well, I grew up here in the city, uh, and so as a young person growing up in the city limits, often people would refer to as the wilderness and nature as two, three hours away. Um, and as a young person growing up, I learned that just over here, there's some deer, uh, there's the coyotes, there's the fox, uh, there's the salmon and the trout in the river, uh, and that... Um, if people have to feel that two hours away it brings them closer to nature and they don't realize that creation is right here in their own backyard, um, we're going to continue to, to destroy the beauty that the world has around us. And so Toronto Aboriginal Eco Tours was to combine Indigenous cultures and worldviews into an experiential learning opportunity to come out on the land, uh, to get a sense of culture. And so... Uh, Living Wild in the City is now uh, more of a, um, an opportunity that I want to provide through, through film, but also uh, bring people out uh, in, in just the way. Look at that big coyote right there on the hillside, coming right down the hillside. Look at that big coyote right there, you know, just right in the middle of the city. Gorgeous colors. You can see how he's changing from his winter black and gray. He's already starting to get the spring undercone, the light colors. Yeah. Beautiful. Oh, yeah, there he goes. That's just a rogue by himself. Yeah. So my sister used to visit a reserve in Fort Severn, and she said that the indigenous people living there don't know how to fish or hunt. Is that true? Uh, well, I think it's not fully true. I think in a large essence, there's possibility some trueness to that. Um, you know, I personally, myself in the city, uh, have had to teach myself how to hunt and fish again. Uh, I didn't have any teachers. Um, but, you know, when it comes to different communities, uh, certain communities are more agricultural based than they are hunting based or fishing based. Um, and so, but in an essence, you know, residential schools took the child from the parent where the parent would teach how to hunt, how to track, how to be on the land. And so being taken at five years of age and coming back at 18 years of age, that was a huge gap. And unfortunately, the sad truth is, yes, a lot of communities have lost traditional ways of connecting on the land, um, but I wouldn't say it's fully lost. I think the beauty is that where we are now, there are 
uh, a lot that have really uh, have ha have done their due diligence to to bring back those cultures. Uh, I couldn't I couldn't be more proud of a culture that has no hatred, resentment, or anger towards anything of the past. In spite of what has happened, you know the beauty is that every day is a new day. Every breath is life. Uh, life is a very uh, hard place. It is full of a lot of uh, depression and a lot of violence and a lot of uh, awful things. Um, but the one thing that is said within the culture, no matter what has happened or what can happen, uh, we have a chance to heal. Uh, we have a chance to, uh, to make the most out of tomorrow. Uh, and so for everything and everything that my elders uh, ever taught me, you know, and I teach this to a group. It's like, hey, listen, when my elders were kids, they didn't get to have fun. They didn't get to play with other kids. They were hidden in the bush. They were uh, stuck underground. They were told uh, to be quiet uh, because the, the, the black vans were coming around to, to, to gather those kids. Um, and so for my elders um, that didn't get to experience uh, those things of life, I, uh, I'm very grateful um, that they were able to share with me uh, things that really, um, I think for others that I share, uh, have a lot of value and meaning. So I want my kids um, to take from everything uh, that uh, I have three boys. Uh, and I think in the essence for those young men uh, is to learn to be providers, uh, to learn that um, in life, as, as much as we can take for ourselves, it's really what we can give to others that uh, brings joy into our life. Uh, so my name uh, is Chichok, uh, and so a formal greeting, I'd say, Wainana Bojo, Chichok in addition to my Inga Dodem, Toronto Adunji, my Wolf Clan, and I was born and raised in Toronto, uh, as well as many different places growing up in foster care and children's aid. And so from what I've been able to put together from my ancestry is that uh, I am Ojibwe, I am Blackfoot, I am Cree, I am Scottish, Irish, Russian, British, and French. And maybe a couple other mixes along the way because really uh, residential schools did its toll. Uh, the lighter skin you were, the less native you would want to be. Uh, and so many, uh, many Canadians have Indigenous ancestry that just uh, they're, not, uh, they're not aware of. We hanged out more with Alan. He showed us how much wildlife there really is in the city. We had late night chats by the fire, and uh, some things are easier said off camera. We were introduced to Gary by uh, somebody from the Toronto Freedom Rally protest circuit. We were told that uh, he's very knowledgeable in effects of uh, residential schools in native culture, and he had personally experienced it all. Gary agreed to uh, sit down and talk with us. And after a few hours of talking, he agreed to do this interview. Yeah, my name is uh, Gary Watsley Kizik. Uh, I live in Toronto, but you know, I'm originally from Mishkigogama uh, First Nation. And that's uh, the other side of Thunder Bay, uh, Thunder Bay, Ontario. Uh, it's the ring of fire, the mining that you hear about. Uh, that's up in that region. It's all about mining up in that area. Uh, Northern Ontario, Michigan, my First Nation. I'm Ojibwe. When you ask me that question about, you know, do you speak your language, Ojibwe? I'm Ojibwe. What they labeled us as Ojibwe. But you know, that's a, that's the thing about this whole experience that we went through as First Nations, the residential schools, the reservations, and other other you know other events that happened to First Nations. They took our language. It's like they took your voice, and that's what I've experienced. Is like, I know a little bit of my language, but not totally. I'm not really uh, capable of uh, conversing with the elders or conversing with my people. But I do have an understanding, but that is what, one thing that, that was done is my language was taken, and that was the Ojibwe language. So, I ended up in uh, my first residential school. I ended up in two residential schools. My first residential school was uh, when I was uh, um, five years old. And that's one of the things that people have to understand is 
You know, I entered it at five, but the policy was four years old. You had to be four years old to 16 to go into a residential school. That was the policy, the law, the rule, um, four to 16. So my first residential school was at five, and then my second residential school, Poplar Hill. Um, the first residential school was Shinwalk Residential School in Sault Ste. Marie, not too far from Toronto. I entered that at five. And then my second residential school was when I was 11. That was in Poplar Hill Residential School, it's called. And it's from, um, what a lot of people don't realize about Poplar Hill Residential School is uh, it was Mennonite run. It was run by Mennonites. See, people think that residential schools were done by uh, United Church, Catholic Church, and uh, Anglican Church. A lot, of, a lot of it is focused on, on these churches. A lot of people don't realize it was also Mennonites that ran residential schools up in northern Ontario. And that has to be recognized because a lot of, a lot of things happened on, in those schools. Well, I live in Toronto, right? Like this, uh, displaced, right? I'm from originally from northern Ontario, but I find myself in a place like Toronto. We are not city people. We are people of the land. So by, by what they did, by creating all this uh, uh, dysfunctionalism and, you know, um, removing us off the land, that's why I call it economic genocide, removing us off the land, right? So people like me, we end up in places like Toronto, Winnip or Winnipeg, Thunder Bay, or wherever, St. John's, um, we end up in places like Toronto and uh, we're displaced people. And like I keep on saying, we're not, we're, we are not of the city. We are not of, you know, we are people of the land. And when I live in Toronto, I feel a little bit, I don't feel right. It's not like I'm not from here, you know. And that is one of my goals is to go back to the land because that's one of the, that's the other thing that I kind of emphasize with our people that we are, not, we are not city people, that we have to go back to the land. What did the Indian residential schools take away from me? Um, can't really say just the one thing that it took from me. Um, it took a whole lot of things from me. Um, I like to use that term economic genocide. Economic genocide, the removal of the people off the land so that they could have access to the resources. And not only reservations were used, but also residential schools were used to remove us off the land. So when you say, when you ask that question, is what did residential schools take away from me? It took a whole lot of things from me. It took all, not only it took my language away from me, because a lot of people don't realize in the residential schools, you were not permitted to speak your language. If you were caught speaking your language, you were you were strapped. You were you were. Uh, um, when you're at the school, all you want to do is go home, go home, and so that's where you learn, you know you're lonely at the school. You just want to go home, right? Or you know depressed. You want to go home, or you don't like the situation you're in at the residential school. So you know there's a lot of things that play into this question when you say, what did they take from you? Not only take the language, but they also took your culture. Like I said, I don't know how to hunt, I don't know how to trap, I don't know how to do what I'm supposed to, originally supposed to be doing, right? Because now I live in the city. Now I you know, I know the city ways, right? I don't know the land. So, like I said, when you ask that question, then that's, there's a whole lot of ways I could answer that question. What did the residential schools take away from me and my people? Yeah, we're outside right now. Now we're on the rock. This is where you want to be. This is where I feel more at home. Even when I live in the city, when I live in an apartment building, um, I feel a little bit displaced. I don't feel as comfortable, eh? But sometimes I'll come here to Yorkville just to sit on the rock, just to be on the rock, because that's what our culture is, the fire, the water and the rock. So the people have to understand that, like, you know? Um, so when I come here, I like sitting on the rock because it's a part of our culture, it's a part of our being. So 
That's what I mean about coming out here. I feel more comfortable here, eh? Oh, no, um, or you, you were asking what other family members were in the residential school? Yeah. Yeah, not only was it me, but also my uncles. And like I said, there was a, a policy, a law, a rule for, for First Nations to be incarcerated in any shape or f any way, shape or form. Whether it, be, whether it be psychiatric hospitals, whether it be the jails, whether it be foster homes, group homes, and training schools. But the residential school played a major part. When I got active, looking into my mother's case, who was, my mother was murdered while I was in a residential school at 11 at Poplar Hill. And I just found out recently, my mother ended up in a residential school when she was seven. Seven years old, she was in a residential school. That shocked me, man. That traumatized me. Because of my, not only from my experience in the residential schools, and I know the damage they did, but to think, way back then my mother was going to residential school, imagine the crimes and the events that were going on way back then. It wasn't only my mother, but like I said, way back then, my, my uncles, my relatives, my friends were all ending up in residential schools, whether it be in the Mushroom, whether it be in Shinwalk, whether it be in um, the residential schools they created up north. But like I said, residential schools have a real history with First Nations, man. They've been doing this. And don't think, don't ever think that they did this, every, you know, just a residential school, the 60 scoop. No, there's always been some sort of scoop every 10 years. Can you imagine that? These have been in existence, what? For 200 years, every 10 years, there was some sort of removal project, removal, removing people off the land. And that's what the elders asked me one time. How come we're not being compensated? And Northern Ontario, if you ever go up to Northern Ontario, up into all the communities up north, you will find, especially with my community, it wasn't just me. The whole community almost went to the re one residential school or some other institution. I so said, we were targeted because I come from a mining region, gold mines and other mining. They had to remove us off the land so that they can have access to the mineral. Get it? Because we've been roaming those lands for what, thousands of years? They had to remove us off the land. That's why they created reservations, residential schools, six scoop and other happenings. That's why I keep on saying, menticide, and that's why I keep on saying economic genocide, and which will create cultural genocide. And that's exactly what happened to me. That's why I talk like that. And like I said, a lot of people have to understand that. It's not about assimilation. It's not about education. It's about removing us off the land so that they have access to the mineral, the water, and the trees. Like, it's all been take, take, take. So how can you call it reconciliation, we've, we've never been on even terms. Even when I got here, I did not know what I had been through when I moved to Toronto 30 years ago. I didn't have a clue. I didn't even know what residential schools were when I started. I thought residential schools were just some building where they put, I didn't know. That's how, that's how they do it. That's how they destroy you, wreck you create dysfunctionalism. And you know, that's what, we're still going through a lot of dysfunctionalism, eh? And doing what I do for the last 30 years, that has been my healing. Doing the blockades, doing the occupations, doing the train tracks, the roads, standing up in court, you know, fighting the charge. That's been my waking up experience. Instead of standing, sitting in front of some psychiatrist, some psychologist, or sitting in some asylum, some, you know, I've had to do what I do today. Get on the front line, you know? Go up against those police, go up against the government, go up against whoever it is that we have to go up against. A lot of energy, man. And to get to that point, I had to quit drinking. I had to quit drugging. I had to quit being homeless. Did you know before I started my activism, before I started activism, I moved here like 30, 30, over 30 years ago. When I moved here, I started working in construction. 
I started working renovations. I was working with Italians, Greeks, Portuguese. I was making the money, man. I could have had my own business. I could have had my own car. I could have had my own house. I could have had my relationships, you know? But I threw all that out to do activism. Now I have nothing. But you know what? I'm happier today. I could have had it all, but, you know, like I got into activism and, but now I have all these answers. When I was working, when I had an apartment, I had a girlfriend, you know, I had a solid job. I was working with all these Italians and Greeks and that. I was on my way up, but I wasn't happy. I was angry, full of rage. I wanted to fight. I wanted to you know, destroy. It was all because of everything that happened. But now, I'm okay now. I'm good now. I want to go home now. Any information that you hear about First Nations should be coming from us. Not from government, not from media. No, 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 no. Get it from the elders. Get it from people like me who have been through the experience of it. And so that's why I like doing this interview. That's why I like working with you people because these guys are asking questions that the mainstream media does not ask. You know, you guys are asking hardcore questions. His life for me. You must read. Um, you're all first nations. He said, there's a policy that says in the residential school, when you're at the residential school, um, one of the policies that they made up was not to inform the child of a passing of a parent. So they used that on me and countless others. My mother was murdered in a, in a small mining town called Central Patricia, Ontario, the other side of Thunder Bay, Pickle Lake, Ontario. It was a mining town back then. So she gets murdered, but I'm at the Poplar Hill Residential School at the time. I'm not informed, I'm not told right away. There's a policy that says, inform the child a year after the fact. Uh, sometimes they choose not to tell you. They chose the year mark on me to inform me of my mother's death. They didn't say that she was murdered. This is how they work the policy. You're sitting in a classroom sitting in a classroom, I'm a kid. This is how the policy works. I'm sitting in a classroom, early in the morning, a teacher comes along and, and pokes you on the side and goes and whispers to you and says, the principal wants to see you after school. So I'm going, you're a kid, you're sitting in class and you're going, Huh? The principal wants to see me after school at his place? So all day long I have to think about that. I have to think about why does the principal want to see me? And as the day goes on and on and on, you get more and more paranoid. You get scared. Why does the principal want to see me after supper at his place? So you know, after supper, hey, you're, you're getting pretty paranoid. I remember every day of that moment. So they were setting me up to inform me about my mother's passing. And I remember being paranoid, putting on my shoes, my coat. I'm a kid. I'm walking towards the door and I, I, stop, at the, I stop at the top of the stairs. I'm looking off to the right, looking at the principal's uh, building where he lives. I'm going, I'm getting, now I'm getting scared. Now we're reaching that moment, right? I'm going down the stairs. I'm going down the trail. I see that door getting bigger and bigger and bigger. I'm going, by the time I get to the door, man, I'm totally freaked out. I don't show it because before that residential school, I had been through five training schools. I had been through foster homes, group homes. I had been through a lot before I entered this residential school. So. 
I finally get to the door. The principal, Kevin, uh, Ken Miller, opens the door. They already have a chair set for me. And his wife is sitting right across from me, from across the table. Ken Miller tells me to sit on the chair. I sit down. He goes over to his wife, puts his arm around her, and sort of like goes, they stare into my eye, you know? They stare at me in the eye. Oh, we, we just called you here to inform you, give you some news about your mother. And by that time, I knew something was up. By that time, I told paranoia. And you know what that moment was supposed to design for? I'm supposed to freak out. I'm supposed to, ah, I'm supposed to break out. I'm supposed to just flip right out, my mother. But like I said, I'd already been through a lot. So I was already hardcore. So when they're telling me, oh, we gave you, we just called you here to give you some bad news about your mother. She passed on, she died. And I'm freaking out, I'm going, inside, I'm like, you know, I'm freaking out, right? When they're informing me, I don't do what they want me to do. They want me to cry out, freak out, break up, whatever, you know? I just sit there and go, huh? You know, I'm going, so, and you know what? Ken Miller, his wife, he's sitting there next to her going like this. And they're looking me in the eye as if they're taunting me, as if they're making fun of me, telling me your mother died. And I'm going, huh, when, what, what happened? And they go, oh, she died about a, a year ago. And then you go into a spin again because how come they didn't inform me? How come they didn't tell me within a week? How come they didn't tell me when it happened? It's that policy that says to, not to inform the child. So that's to screw you up so bad you end up alcoholic, drug addicted, homeless, exactly what they wanted me to do and exactly what happened to me. So anyways, they, they informed me, my mother, um, and I flip out. And you know what? It's a Christian run school. It's, a, it's Mennonite. When you're being informed by Christians and Mennonites and other religions, there's usually a hug, usually a prayer, usually some sort of counseling. But you know what? They informed me. Five minutes. It's all over and done with. And you know what Ken Miller says? Okay, go back to your dorm, go to sleep. That's one of the most worst crimes that you can do to anybody not being able to attend the funeral. A lot of shit happened to me in this lifetime. I've been shot at, stabbed at, beaten. I've been through quite a bit in this life, you know, on the whole thing. But not being able to attend my mother's funeral, that is the worst thing that they could have ever done. That's, that's the most pain that I've ever felt, not being able, because I never got that closure. So I never got to know my mother. I never got to know who she was, never got to, call her mommy. I've never said mommy in my lifetime. They put me in a, in a group home, in another detention center after the residential school. I couldn't go home no more. I had no parents. So I have to stand there at the residential school and watch them fly off to their homes, going home. I'm standing at the dock. I'm watching everybody go, go home. I can't go home. My mother's dead. They have, now the government has me in their total control. Oh, that's all my life was, was, was detention centers, foster homes, group homes, training schools, one institution after another up to that point. If he hadn't killed my mother, or if my mother hadn't been killed, I wouldn't be standing here talking to you today. I wouldn't be doing the activism, I wouldn't, what you guys call activism, I wouldn't uh, be doing train blockades, road blockades, but because of my mother, and I give my cred credit to my mother, for being where I am today. Gary confronted the man that, uh, that he believed killed his mother uh, when he was in on his deathbed in the hospital. And I think Gary made peace with this guy. There's many articles about it. Gary's managed to uh, make a name for himself in defending the native rights and protesting the cause all over the place.
My name is Theodore Flamand. Um, I'm from Manitoulin Island, Wee Quem Kong. Uh, if I were to speak Ojibwe, my introduction would be Ani, Manga Makate Shkure Dejnakaz, Wee Quem Kong Donjba. Quite basically, that's Hi, my name is Theodore Flamand, or Wolf Blackfire, as it's translated. And I'm from Wee Quem Kong, Manitoulin Island. I work here at Soho Art Gallery and Framing here in Toronto on Roncesvalles. But in terms of framing, I had been framing for the past six years in different cities throughout Ontario. I was living in a homeless shelter and I had a portfolio with basic photography and some hands-on skills with my diploma and I was going to random places in town. And I was fortunate enough and lucky enough that one of the framing places, formerly known as LND's Art Gallery and Framing, were able to take me on off the street without any training. And I got my start there. I learned all of it um, by myself and with my coworkers. Art has been a lifelong interest. There has always been something worth looking at and something worth understanding. And I've always wanted to know how I can create my own. I live by the seven grandfather teachings. There's like, they are basically tenets to live by. And I incorporate each of these teachings into how I live and how I create. And these teachings are love, honesty, respect, humility, strength, truth, and wisdom. And indigenous and native art has long and deep reaching roots. Throughout uh, Canada, you'll notice that there is this northern woodlands style art with thick black lines and flat colors and some exaggerated features that if you take note of them, you'll begin to notice that lots of Canadian artists, including the group of seven, surprisingly, have some of these traits. If I could go anywhere in Ontario, I believe I would go back to my homeland of Manitoulin. The residential schools have played a major part here in Ontario, and unfortunately, my family has very close ties to it. My grandparents are survivors, but not everyone had come back. On Manitoulin Island specifically, the residential school had closed down in 1911, if I recall correctly. It was burnt down twice. Then it moved on to Spanish Ontario, and that's where it resided until the late 1900s. The residential school stories, they are all harrowing. There is a deep darkness that not many people talk about and that the people who do know how to talk about it aren't usually comfortable discussing it. The effects of residential schools have this intergenerational traumatic effect that trickle down. The residential schools were an attempt at eradicating the Native American. If I may use um, a paraphrased quote, the goal of residential schools was to kill the Indian inside the child and let the white boy free. It was eradication, it was erasure, it was genocide. It was used as a tool to disrupt and separate these families and communities so that whoever was in control could receive the benefits of land resources. This healing, the type of healing required is generational, where the changes I make, I may not directly feel, but if I were to have any kids, they would be reaping the benefits. Uh, for residential school survivors and for anybody who has been closely affected, I believe the best result would be to find a way to showcase your expression of healing. Learning of what was lost and what was stolen, learning of what happened and how to recuperate. And each generation learns things differently and sees things just as differently. And my big question is, down the line, the next generation Will they only be hearing it as stories, or will it be something that they still feel? These stories are history. What happened in residential schools, what happened in Canada, is the same history that should be within the pages as the Declaration of Independence and Governance Rising. It should be something that is up in the forefront, that anybody can pick up any encyclopedia and read true facts about. I'd say we're halfway there. This interview is a good example of how far we've come. I don't believe people in my generation or previously would have had the opportunity or experience to vocalize everything. Non-Indigenous Canadians should be able to, at a surface level, grasp and catch on to what happened and see the atrocities for what they are. 
as it stands, we still have to dig rather deep or shallow, if depends on how you look at it, to get to the core information where the truth lies. The truth is important because it's who we are and what happened to us and how we overcome these challenges. The truth is who we are as a people, indigenous to this land, that um, First Nations were here first. And prior to the 1800s, prior to first contact, the entire country was manicured like a garden with wooden cities within days walking distance and millions of people in between. It was its own country. Dreamcatcher making and regalia crafting. These are long-standing skills. In the Ojibwe culture specifically, there was no original written language. So all of the knowledge was passed on verbally through showing how to do things and what happens when things are done. So things like dream catcher making and drum making and regalia, leather tanning, uh, crafting uh, quill boxes, uh, using mixed media as a form of art within itself and creating things that aren't meant to last because nature is cyclical. It's a great circle. There is no beginning, middle or end. We are all one. There is cultural appropriation, but just like any other culture, it's like a mixing pot. You get all of these ingredients together in a pot and things are going to start melding together. But what I would like is for people to understand that it happened and it's close. And the last residential school closed down in 1991 and that's not long ago. Uh, alcohol wasn't introduced to my culture or specifically my region until around 18... 50 or so. I want to say first contact during the time when they were trying to negotiate treaties and trying to negotiate land shares, they'd get them all drunk before signing everything. And that's just downright predatory. So since then, I believe uh, alcohol was used as a tool by residential schools and by the, by the crown, essentially, as a means of suppressing and silencing people who wanted to speak out and act out on all the conditions that were happening. There was this chart that I had come across. I'm not sure exactly what it was called, but it was three circles and it was used to help illustrate exactly how far we've come on this journey for generational healing. So let's call this point here, this X, like contact, point zero, where the residential schools happened. And these are our parents, and this is our parents or grandparents' generation. And it would start narrow and slowly open up as they realized they're still here. And then the grandparents, their culture was snuffed out. They were told not to speak the language and they were told not to even try understand. That would be the grandparents. And then my parents or the parents would be a little bit more wider, a little bit more open, where they're starting from a point of understanding where the previous generation had left off. And I would be third down the line where the understanding is opening up even more and encompassing even more of the empty space. And it would be here, it was like the point of erasure. And down here, generations down the line, it would be the point of reawakening, where people like myself are coming to understand exactly what happened, how deep the culture goes, and how we all can learn from it.